you, sir. Thank you, Steve, and uh, good afternoon, all of you. This is Kunal Shah from ICICI Securities. Uh, today to discuss uh, Housing Development Finance Corporation's uh, Q4 FY21 and FY21 uh, uh, earnings, we have with us uh, Mr. K.K. Mystery, uh, Vice Chairman and uh, CEO, Mr. Conrad uh, D'Souza, Member of Executive Management and uh, Chief Investor uh, Relations Officer, and other senior members uh, uh, of the management. Uh, firstly, thank, uh, let me thank you for giving us an opportunity to host the uh, first uh, earnings call of uh, HDFC. And uh, over to you, uh, Keki, sir. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to welcome all of you to HDFC's earnings call for the fourth quarter and for the financial year ended March 31st, 2021. Let me also thank Jaideep and Kunal from ISEC for hosting this call. The board of directors at this meeting held earlier today approved the annual, the audited financial results for the year ended March 31st, 2021. And over the next few minutes, I will try to give you a quick summary of some of the key highlights of the performance for the year. As you are aware, the country went into a lockdown from the third week of March 2020. And as a housing finance company, our offices were shut for most part of the first two months of the financial year. The phased opening of our offices really started only in June of 2020. As a consequence, we had a very low growth in individual loan disbursements during the first quarter. At that time, and I'm talking of April, May of 2020, based on the then prevailing circumstances, we expected to achieve approximately 75 to 80 percent of the FY 2020 individual loan disbursements during FY 2021. However, a series of measures undertaken by the government and RBI, as well as the digitalization of major parts of our business operations, led to a significantly better performance by the time we completed the year. The year was characterized by the stimulus package announced by the government of India, enhanced liquidity measures by RBI, which not only ensured that there was adequate liquidity in the system, but also that the liquidity was made available to all segments of the market. We also saw a drop in the repo rates by 115 basis points by RBI and the consequent reduction in interest rates, both on our assets as well as on our liabilities. We also saw an extension of the tax benefits on housing loans and affordable housing projects. We saw an extension of CLSS for affordable housing uh, as you know, RBI announced a moratorium on payment for customers. This was initially for three months from March 1, 2020, and then was extended by a further period of three months. We also saw a one-time restructuring package, which included real estate among the 26 sectors. Another very important feature of the year was the stamp duty cut in Maharashtra from 5% to 2% up to December 31st, 2020, and 3% thereafter from January 21 to March 31st, 2021. This had an impact on the retail business in the second half of the year. Maharashtra branches accounted for 28% of the disbursements in the second half as compared to 26% in the same period in the previous year. So effectively, we saw a 2 percentage points rise in the uh, business that we generated from Maharashtra. Let me now quickly try to summarize the progress of our business through the year. The first quarter was significantly impacted due to the lockdown and the resulting inability to open our offices during a major part of the quarter. During the period April to June 2020, our individual loan disbursements were just 37% of what they had been in the corresponding first quarter of the previous year. We started seeing a sharp pickup in disbursements during the second quarter. Our individual loan disbursements in the second quarter were as much as 95% of what they had been in the corresponding second quarter of the previous year. So even in the second quarter, we were 5% lower than what, they, what we had been in the previous year's second quarter. However, despite the pickup that we saw in the second quarter, individual loan disbursements for the six-month period, which is April to September 2020, was still 35% lower than that of the corresponding period in the previous year. There was an extremely strong recovery in the second half, significantly faster, significantly greater than what we had envisaged at the start of the year. Our individual loan disbursements 
grew by 42% in the period October 2020 to March 2021 compared to the corresponding period in the previous year. And you must remember that the previous year, which is October 2019 to March 2020, was unaffected by COVID except for the last 15 days, whereas this six-month period was relatively affected. The month of March 2021 witnessed the highest ever level of, in terms of receipts, approvals, and disbursements. During the quarter ended March 31st, 2021, individual loan disbursements grew by 60% 6 over the corresponding fourth quarter of the previous year. Growth in home loans was seen in both the affordable housing segment as well as in middle and high end properties. For the full year, individual loan disbursements were higher by about 3% compared to the previous year as compared to the negative growth that we had envisaged at the start of the year. Our individual loan approvals for the year ended March 31st, 2021 were higher by 10% compared to the previous year. The number of individual loan applications received were 8% higher than the previous year. But you must remember that 8% is in the context of the whole year, and out of that whole year, the first quarter was almost a complete quarter. During the year, our loan book increased to rupees 4,98,298 crores in March 2021, a growth of 11%. In addition to this, the loan securitized by HDFC and outstanding as of, as of March 31st, 2021, amounted to rupees 71,596 crores. HDFC continues to service these loans. The assets under management as of March 31st, 2021, amounted to rupees 569,894 crores as compared to rupees 5,16,733 crores in the previous year, giving a growth of 10%. Individual loan growth on an AUM basis was 12%. During the year, we sold loans aggregating to rupees 18,980 crores. If these loans had not been sold, then the growth in the individual loan book would have been 19%, and the growth in the overall loan book would have been 15%. One of the reasons for the lower growth in the non-individual book was the development of the REITs market. We received prepayments on our lease rental discounting book from REIT issues amounting to rupees 9,397 crores, which accounted for about 7% of the opening non-individual book. During the quarter January 21 to March 2021, we sold loans aggregating to rupees 7,500 crores. For the full year, the total loan sold aggregated to rupees 18,980 crores. These loans were all assigned to HDFC Bank, pursuant to the mortgage sharing agreement that we have with the bank. Prepayment on retail loans were lower at 10.3% of the opening loan balance as compared to 10.9% in the previous year. And as shareholders are aware, generally we have seen prepayments in the range of 10 to 12 percent of the of, of the loans outstanding at the beginning of the year. This year, as I said, was 10.3 percent. The average size of individual loans for the year ended March 31st, 2021, stood at rupees 29.5 lakhs, compared to rupees 27 lakhs in the previous year. For the quarter ended March 31, 2021, the average loan was higher at rupees 31.4 lakhs as a result of increased activity in the metro cities post-lifting of lockdown restrictions. Our trust on affordable housing uh, continued unabated. During the year ended March 31, 2021, 33% of home loans approved in terms of numbers and 16% in terms of value were to customers from the economically weaker section or the lower income group. The average home loan to customers in the economically weaker section was rupees 10.8 lakhs, and to customers in the lower income group was rupees 18.6 lakhs. If we break up the loan book outstanding on March 31st, 2021 into different categories, then individual loans constitute 77% of the total book as compared to 74% in the previous year. Construction finance constitutes 10% of the total loan book. Lease rental discounting loans constitute 7% of the total loan book, 
while corporate loans constitute 6%. As you can see, therefore, the bulk of the growth is on account of individual loans. This is obviously on an EUM basis. If we were to look at incremental loan book growth, earlier we were looking at the total balance sheet growth, now let's look at incremental loan book growth and split that growth between individuals and non-individuals. Then for the year ended March 31st, 2021, as much as 92% of the growth was on individual loans and only the balance 8% was on account of non-individual loans. If we were to look at this number, which is the incremental growth on a quarterly basis and look at only the fourth quarter, which is January to March 2021, then as much as 116% of the incremental loan book growth came from individual loans and non-individual loans were actually a negative 16%. Total loan source from distribution channels was 98%, of which HDFC sales was 54%, HDFC Bank was 27% and third party uh, direct sales agents was 17%. That's, that's as much as 83% of our individual business was sourced directly or through our associates. And as you are aware, uh, in all cases, even if the loan is sourced to other distribution partners, the credit appraisal, the legal checks, the technical checks, the decision on whether to pay the loan to a particular customer or not, the decision on when to disperse money, how much money to disperse, is all taken by our own people. The Emergency Credit Line Guarantee Scheme was announced by the Finance Minister in May 2020 to mitigate the economic distress caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We approved an amount of rupees 2,481 crores under the facility, of which about 936 crores has been dispersed till March 31st, 2021. Amounts disbursed under this facility are guaranteed by the government. The Reserve Bank of India permitted a one-time restructuring of loans under its resolution for COVID-19 related stress. In this regard, the aggregate amount of loans being restructured amounted to rupees 4,479 crores, which is 0.8% of our AUM. Out of the loans that were restructured, 27% were individual loans and 73% were non-individual loans. Also out of the total restructured loans, as much as 58% of the total was in respect of just one account. Overall collection efficiency ratios for individual loans have improved, nearing pre-COVID levels. The collection efficiency for individual loans in the month of March 21 stood at 98% compared to 96.3% in the month of September 2020. As per regulatory norms, the gross non-performing loans as at March 31st, 2021 stood at rupees 9,759 crores, equivalent to 1.98% of the loan portfolio. Non-performing individual loans stood at 0.99%, whilst non-performing non-individual loans stood at 4.77%. During sec the second half of the year, we have also seen some resolutions in respect of some of the non-individual accounts. As per regulatory norms, based solely on the period of default, the corporation is required to carry a total provision of Rs 5,491 crores as of March 31st, 2021, as against which the actual provision carried is as much as Rs 13,025 crores. The excess provision over the regulatory requirement is Rs 7,534 crores, which is as much as 137% higher than the minimum required under the regulation. So while the regulations require us to carry a provision of uh, 5,491 crores, we actually carry more than double that at 13,025 crores. Under INDAS, asset classification and provisioning has moved from the incurred loss model to the expected credit loss model for providing for future credit losses. Based on this model, the total EAD of Rs. 4,97,208 crores is broken up into Stage 1, Stage 2, and Stage 3. Stage 1 loans constitute 91.4%, Stage 2 is 63 percent and Stage 3 is 23 percent This is exposure EAD. EAD would include the interest component. 
There has been an increase in stage two assets from 5.5% to 6.3%. And this is largely because loans, some of the loans which were classified as stage one in the previous year and who have opted for the CLGS have been classified as stage two accounts based on a qualitative assessment of the respective exposures. Further, all loans which have opted for the OTR, the one-time restructuring, have all been classified as stage two assets. During the year, we have charged a profit and loss account with a sum of Rs. 2,948 crores, of which Rs. 719 crores was in the fourth quarter on account of Pravishti. The ECL to EAD coverage ratio for stage 2 assets is 19% and for stage 3 is 52%. The provisions carried as a percentage of the EAD amounted to 2.62%. As of March 31st, 2021, we carry a COVID-19 provisioning of Rs. 844 crores. We will, in the course of this year, review this provision. As earlier, we continue to hold all our investments in HDFC Bank, HDFC Life, HDFC Asset Management, and all our, all, all our other subsidiary and associate companies at the original cost of acquisition, which is the price we have paid while making these investments. These investments are thus not accounted for on a fair value basis. If we were to mark to market the investments as of March 31st, 2021, the unrealized gain, which is the difference between the market price as of March 31st, 2021, and the carrying cost, which would be as much as rupees 2 lakh 61,590 crores. Accordingly, we carry an unrecognized gain or an unbooked gain of 2 lakh 61,590 crores, which is not part of our net worth, nor is it part of our capital adequacy calculations. During the year, Reserve Bank of India had mandated that we reduce our shareholding in to 50% or below in both HDFC Life and HDFC LV. The reduction in the shareholding of HDFC Life was largely done in the period April to June of 2020, and the reduction in the shareholding of HDFC LV will be completed this month. Even after the reduction of the shareholding to below 50%, HDFC Life continues to be consolidated under index accounting norms. On August 11, 2020, HDFC completed the qualified institutional placement of equity shares at NCD simultaneously with warrants. We raised rupees 10,000 crores through the issue of equity shares. We also raised warrants at an exercise price of, of, I'm sorry, at an issue price of Rs. 180 and an exercise price of Rs. 2,165 per share, which represents a 32% premium over the then prevailing market price of the share at the time of the issue. As a result, we received an upfront non-refundable amount of Rs. 307 crores. As of date, no warrants have been converted into equity shares. The maximum equity dilution on account of the aforesaid QRP issue, assuming full conversion at the warrant exercise price, will be 4.23% of the enhanced share capital. The amount of NCDs raised as a, as a part of this transaction amounted to Rs. 3,693 crores for a tenor of three years. Our capital adequacy stood at 22.2% of which tier one capital was 21.5% and tier two capital was 0.7%, which is way above the regulatory requirement of what we are required to carry. As per the regulatory norms, the minimum requirement for the capital adequacy ratio and tier one capital for F521, which is the current year, is 14% and 10% uh, respectively. So 14% total capital adequacy and 10% tier one capital, against which we are actually carrying 22.2% total capital adequacy and 21.5% tier one. As at March 31st, 2021, the risk weighted assets to that would be 398,000 crores. During the year, our total borrowings increased to Rs. 4,41,365 crores. The year began with uncertainty on interest rates as well as liquidity. However, full credit must be given to RBI for taking a variety of measures 
can help in pooling the money markets and providing the liquidity support that the market required. And this liquidity support uh, saw the growth of lending in the financial system. Uh, we were one of the beneficiaries of that. Term loans, including external commercial borrowings and refinance from the National Housing Bank, accounted for 24% of borrowings. Market borrowings, that is NCDs and commercial paper, accounted for 42% of the borrowings. Deposits was a major source of funding during the year. Deposits as at the year end stood at rupees 1,50,131 crores, a growth of 13%. Crystal and ICRA have for the 26th consecutive year reaffirmed the Crystal FAAA status uh, stable and ICRA's NAAA stable ratings uh, for the corporation's deposits. We now have over 20.8 lakh deposit accounts from over 6.9 lakh depositors. We also have uh, 52,897 deposit agents who account for 94% of the deposit collections. Deposits accounted for 80% of the incremental borrowings in the current year and constitute 34% of the outstanding borrowings as of March 31st, 2021. I've always emphasized in my interaction with investors that there are two ways to look at the net interest income. One method is to consider only interest and the other is to, look, is to also take into account the profit that is booked at the time of selling a loan. If we were to calculate the NII purely on the basis of interest without taking cognizance of the sale of loans, then the NII for the year ended March 31, 2021 stood at Rs. 15,172 crores compared to Rs. 12,904 crores in the previous year, representing an increase of 18%. In the same manner, the NI for the quarter ended March 31, 2021 stood at Rs. 4,065 crores compared to Rs. 3,564 crores in the corresponding fourth quarter of the previous year. The second way to compute the net interest income is to also include the income of sale of loans. This income is effectively an upfronting of the future interest on loans that are sold on a discounted basis and after reducing estimated future expenses. Under index accounting standards, this is a requirement that when a loan is sold, this income has to be accounted for upfront and is reflected as a separate item in the profit and loss account. And most analysts take this into account while cal calculating the net interest income. During the quarter, we sold loans aggregating to Rs. 7,503 crores and booked an income of Rs. 438 crores. If you were to include this income of 438 crores as part of the NI, and I repeat, this is the way almost all analysts do it, and also consider similar income in the previous year, then the net interest income for the quarter would be Rs. 4,532 crores compared to Rs. 3,846 crores in the fourth quarter of the previous year, amounting to an increase of 18%. Similarly, for the full year, the NI would have been Rs. 16,372 crores compared to Rs. 13,909 crores in the previous year, showing a similar increase of 18%. During the year, due to the uncertainty caused due to the pandemic, we carried a huge amount of excess liquidity. We began reducing the high liquidity levels during the year. The excess liquidity was largely deployed in overnight liquid funds and actually yielded a negative carry of 2.33%. In other words, the income we got from investing that money in overnight liquid funds was 2.33% lower than the cost of funds. Net interest margin for the year ended March 31, 2021 stood at 3.5% compared to 3.4% in the previous year. The spread on loans over the cost of borrowing for the year ended March 31, 2021 was 2.29%. The spread on the individual loan book was 1.93% and on the non-individual book was 3.32%. Previous year spread had been 2.27%, thus there has been uh, two basis points, a 0.02% improvement in the spreads for the year.
income earned from deployment of surplus funds and cash management schemes of mutual funds was lower at rupees 813 crores as compared to rupees 1102 crores in the previous year despite much higher levels of daily surplus funds being invested. This was due to a sharp drop in short-term rates, where we earned just 3.75% on an average uh, on our surplus liquidity, as compared to over 6% in the previous year. During the year, we earned Rs. 734 crores by way of dividend income, as compared to Rs. 1,081 crores in the previous year. There was a drop in dividend income in the first half as we did not receive dividends from our investments in HDFC Bank and the insurance companies on account of the direction stipulated by RBI and IRDA. While banks were unable to pay dividends in the second half of the year also, the restriction was lifted by IRDA for insurance companies. Accordingly, the corporation received dividends from HDFC Ergo in March 2021. During the year, we booked profit on sale of investments amounting to a much lower level than last year. Our profit that we booked this year was 1,398 crores compared to 3,524 crores in the previous year. Profit on sale of investments during the previous year was largely on account of sale of a part of our holding and group finance. Also in the previous year, and it's very important to understand that and all analysts and all shareholders are aware of it, Last year, an amount of Rs. 9,020 crores was booked as fair value gain consequent to the merger of Blue Finance with Bandhan Bank as per the requirements of the INDAS accounting standards. Also under the INDAS accounting standards, the stock options granted to employees are measured at fair value of the options at the time of the grant. The fair value of the options is accounted for as employee compensation cost over the resting period on a straight line basis. Accordingly, employee benefit expenses for the year includes an amount of Rs. 338 crores compared to only Rs. 14 crores in the previous year. Accounts for the quarter ended March 31st, 2021 include a charge of Rs. 144 crores compared to just 3 crores in the previous year. For the year ended March 31st, 2021, the cost to income ratio stood at 7.7% as compared to 9.0% in the previous year. Coming to the profitability, for the, year, for the quarter ended March 31st, 2021, the standalone profit before tax was Rs. 3,924 crores compared to Rs. 2,692 crores in the fourth quarter of the previous year. Similarly, for the full year, Profit before tax to that rupees 14,815 crores compared to 20,351 crores in the previous year. Whereas, as I explained to you, this 20,351 crores includes more than 9,000 crores of profits that were booked only because of the accounting requirement when GRU was merged into Bandhan Bank. So, on the face of it, the profit before tax for the full year is lower than what it was in the previous year, but as you all know, uh, the primary reason was that in the third quarter, we had booked the actual amount of 9,020 crores, uh, which was booked consequent to the merger of Blue Finance with Bandhan Bank. Tax for the fourth quarter stood at Rs. 744 crores compared to Rs. 4,460 crores in the previous year. For the full financial year, tax provision stood at Rs. 2,788 crores compared to Rs. 2,581 crores in the previous year. The tax rate for the year was 18.8%. The standalone profit after tax for the fourth quarter stood at Rs. 3,180 crores, or 42% increase compared to Rs. 2,233 crores in the fourth quarter of the previous year. The profit after tax for the full year stood at Rs. 12,027 crores. Pre-tax return on average assets, excluding sale of strategic assets, was 2.6% and the post-tax return on average assets was 2.1%. The basic and diluted EPS on, on a face value of rupees 2 per share uh, was 68 rupees 11 paisa and the diluted value was 67 rupees and 90 paisa. And I repeat, this is on a face value of 2 rupees a share. The consolidated profit before tax for the fourth quarter stood at Rs. 6,717 crores 
as compared to 4,951 crores, a growth of 36%. The consolidated profit after tax for the fourth quarter stood at Rs 5,683 crores as compared to Rs 4,342 crores, a 31% increase over the fourth quarter of last year. As mentioned earlier, the numbers for the full year are not strictly comparable to that of the previous year on account of the amalgamation of career finance with Bandhan Bank in the third quarter of the previous year. On a consolidated, consolidated basis, for the year ended March 31, 2021, the profit before tax was Rs 24,237 crores as compared to Rs 26,193 crores in the previous year. After providing Rs 3,750 crores for tax compared to 3,367 crores in the previous year, the profit after tax but before CI stood at Rs 20,488 crores uh, for the current year. The profit attributable to the corporation was Rs 18,740 crores. The Board of Directors, after assessing the capital buffers and liquidity levels, have recommended a dividend of Rs 23 per equity share of Rs 2 each as compared to Rs 21 per share in the previous year. The dividend payout ratio is 34.5%. As at March 31st, 2021, we had 3,226 employees. Our total assets per employee stood at Rs. 171 crores. This is per employee, I repeat. Net profit per employee was Rs. 3.4 crores. Our distribution network spans 593 outlets, which include 203 offices of HDFC's wholly owned distribution company, HDFC Sales Private Limited. We cover additional locations through our outreach programs. To cater to non-resident Indians, we have offices in London, Dubai, and Singapore, and service associates in the Middle East. During these trying times, I do believe we have much to be grateful for. Our employees have been working relentlessly through extremely difficult circumstances, and it is their effort that has helped the organization tie the work trying times. It remains a constant endeavor to keep raising the bar on customer service. The well-being of our employees is of paramount importance to us. We also appreciate the measures taken by the government and our regulators in bringing confidence and stability in the financial system, which in turn has helped us navigate the past year. We will continue to engage deeply with all our stakeholders. Towards this end, we stand committed on environment, social, and governance parameters. Our business responsibility report and the integrated report, which we shall shortly host on our website, provides our activities in the area of ESG. During the year, our corporate social responsibility activities focus primarily on COVID-19 relief, healthcare, sanitation, education, and livelihoods. CSR activities were con conducted either directly or through the HD Parik Foundation. The total CSR spent during the year was Rs 190 crores. So in conclusion, let me say that the above are some of the highlights of the results of the year ended March 31st, 2021. As you can see, we have seen a sharp increase in the demand for housing loans during the year. The second wave and partial lockdowns across the country have brought new challenges. But given the digitalization of our operations, as well as the learnings of the past year, we are confident that we are well equipped to face the year ahead. The bottlenecks during the second wave are significantly lesser than what we experienced in March 2020. I must also say that as of date, this is as of yesterday, disbursements since April 1 for the year have already crossed the disbursements we achieved in the whole of the first quarter of last year. Before I conclude, I would like to wish each one of you good health. Please stay safe. We may now proceed to question answers, and I would request you to kindly introduce yourself and be brief with your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. A reminder to the participants, please submit your questions to two per participant. 
should you have any follow up we would request you to rejoin the queue the first question is from the line of maru garjania from ilara securities please go ahead yeah hi congratulations uh, could you uh, give this figure for slippages for the whole year and if possible uh, broken down into individual and non individual so you will see the detailed presentation i talked about the stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 results in my talk uh, you would see that there is an increase in the level of stage 2 loans but this is primarily because of the fact that some of the restructured in fact all the one time restructured loans that we had we uh, downgraded them from stage 1 to stage 2 and also loans which had taken the uh, emergency line uh, we looked at it qualitatively and in many of these cases we reduced uh, we downgraded them from stage 1 to stage 2 so to give you a sense uh, our stage 1 accounts per constitute 91.4% stage 2 constitutes 6.3% and stage 3 constitutes 2.3% but we are extremely conservative as i said earlier in our provisioning which is reflected in the fact that the total provision that we carry is more than double more than double what is required by regulation and we've been extremely proactive in terms of downgrading loans wherever we saw the slightest degree of stress from stage 1 to stage 2 as far as non performing loans are concerned the numbers have more or less the same as what they were last year last year was 1.99% in the aggregate this year is 1.98% individual non this is a total individual non performing loan stand at 0.99% non individual stand at 4.77% what would why why has the stage 2 loan declined uh, sequentially it because of slippage no stage 2 would have declined primarily because there would have been some resolution in some of these loans or there would have been some prepayments in some of these loans and some of these cases would have got downgraded to stage 3 in stage 3 there is no material difference okay thank you thank you the next question is from the line of manish oswal from nirmal bang please go ahead yes sir Th- thank you for the opportunity sir Uh, my question on the uh, non individual portfolio uh, gross np levels that is 4.77% so uh, can you comment on the the trend uh, going ahead in this portfolio sir you know it's very difficult for me to comment on a portfolio you see for example if you look at the project which is stuck now the project requires incremental funding but every rupee that we give to that project once it is classified as a non performing loan continues to be classified the new money which is given continues to be classified as a non performing loan even though by giving that additional money to the project you are effectively completing the construction of the project and therefore in all likelihood you will get the whole whole amount back so i think just looking at the non performing loan number is not necessarily uh, you know the best way to look at it i would say that uh, we are very proactive in terms of uh, uh, downgrading accounts from stage 1 to stage 2 wherever we see the slightest degree of stress and then carry special provisioning in respect of those accounts and even uh, from stage 2 to stage 3 if we believe that the stress is uh, has increased or sort of has not got uh, repaired then we would downgrade that from stage 2 to stage 3 So, sir, uh, the second question on the uh, quality of growth in your press release, you mentioned that uh, uh, the ticket size has increased because of some higher activity in the metro city. So, c- can you comment on the uh, growth in the non-metro city? How there is the growth rates or the contributions? Non-metro city is higher for is it should be limited on increment of growth basis. Well, the growth has been both in the high-end market as well as in the affordable housing market. Uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, cities like mumbai for example or delhi for that matter or bangalore would have also seen a, a robust growth during the course of the of this year uh, our total disbursement growth in the third quarter in the aggregate was as much as uh, 60% 60 and if we were to look at uh, the, the third quarter our growth in total disbursements was 26% in the aggregate and this would be a combination of uh, Uh, affordable housing and non affordable housing in terms of affordable housing that is loans which to customers in the economically weaker section or in the lower income group i mentioned earlier that 33% of the loans in terms of that of uh, numbers 
poor to customers who are in the economically weaker section or in the lower income group. So in numbers, 33% were in the EWS category, EWS or LIG category, 67% were in the uh, middle income or the middle income category. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Adarsh P from CLSA. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Congrats and good numbers. Um, so one question is, uh, the last two years, a lot of the provisioning that we've done in the PNL uh, has strengthened the balance sheet uh, at 2.3, 2.4% of overall AUMs is provisions. Going forward, uh, does this provision cover give us the comfort that the PNL provision requirement can go down? We can go back to the 10, 15 basis points that we've had in the past, or because of phase two, we'll continue to kind of provide for some more time. See, historically, other sharp policy is to stay work provided in the sense to envisage every possible theoretical risk which is which could possibly come about and create a provision well in advance. You would have seen that a couple of years ago, uh, a lot of banks, a number of banks, reported losses for two or three quarters because they had to catch up on the provisioning that they sort of, uh, uh, you know, were lacking. We have been extremely proactive in that provisioning and we would like to continue maintaining a policy of keeping, uh, you know, keeping a, a, a large amount of provisioning. So, as I said earlier, if we go strictly by the regulatory requirements, which is what most companies would do, uh, the total provisioning we need to carry in the balance sheet would be 5,491 crores, against which we are actually carrying a provision of as much as 13,025 crores. We are carrying a provision which is 7,500 crores more, 7,534 crores to be precise, more than what is required by regulations. So we will continue with the practice or the policy of being very proactive in our provisioning. But um, any threshold you all can indicate or you can indicate as to where you would uh, say that as maybe as a percentage of loans that you come to where it's saying that beyond which we don't need to build more buffers? See, we have built a sufficient enough buffer as things stand now. But having said that, this you now have this new second wave of COVID, so we have to be, you know, keep the higher provisioning in place for the next few quarters because we don't really know how uh, the second phase is going to sort of pan out. The first phase that we saw of COVID did not impact asset quality in any significant manner. As you see in the individual category, let's talk of individuals first because that is the bulk of the business. Uh, in the individual cat category, gross non-performing loans went up by one basis point, which is neither here nor there. So 0 0.98 becomes, became 0.99%. But uh, as a policy, we carry a provisioning which is uh, which is much more than what is required. Well, also, we carry also also I must say we carry buffers. So we sort of take into account uh, events that should this happen or should you know the COVID-19 stress affect uh, certain sectors. How many employees do we have who are working in those sectors? How will they get affected in terms of? Their salaries, their uh, you know their income, and therefore carry buffers or carry provisioning on that. Okay. Uh, my last question is um, on um, you give us fairly good disclosures um, on the on the breakup of stage one, two, three assets, uh, both individual and corporates. Uh, you did mention in your opening remarks the stage two in the non-corporate part of which is ECL, GS, or restructuring. But that still is a relatively large portfolio. It's 24,000 crores, and net of the provision, it's 19,000 crores. Uh, could you give some more color on that portfolio that, that gives comfort on where servicing is, what's the kind of risk that we're dealing with that in, in, in that book, the asset cover? Is any any color you can provide? You are talking of non individual loans, sorry, avoid. Non individual stage two. Non individual stage two. Yes. So, non individual stage two, two as we speak, stands at uh, 24,000 crores, of which, as you know, restructuring was about 5,600 odd crores, all of which were 5,000 odd crores, all of which will be appearing in this category. Uh, of the of the uh, ECL, GS, also some part of that on a qualitative basis would come under stage two. 
So whenever we see that the default that the, the customer is finding it difficult to pay installments on time or there is a default of one month or two months, we immediately downgrade that loan to stage two. This is particularly so in case of non-individual loans because if you look at projects, if you look at construction finance, if there is a delay in making payment in uh, in a month or for two months, immediately the loan gets downgraded to stage two, even though the security cover that we may have on that loan is very, very significant. So you must understand that what we are giving loans against is housing. It's real estate. So there is a value to that real estate. When we are making these provisions on a conservative basis or on a proactive basis, we are not taking cognizance of the fact that we still have carry a reasonably large security cover. Got it. Uh, thank you, sir. Thanks for answers. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Suresh Ganapati from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks. I have three quick questions. One is, uh, you know, on the second wave, of course, you said that the April disbursements are um, even higher than the full last year's first quarter disbursements. Can you comment on the collection aspect? Uh, is it good compared to the previous quarter? So you said as a decline collection efficiency from an April perspective. The second question is, the RBI's requirement for you to bring down to less than 50%. Is RBI asking you to further reduce it? Is it, uh, is it something that the that you are engaging in a dialogue with Reserve Bank of India? Can this number go to 20% in subsidiaries eventually? And the third aspect is on the NHB rules of having 50% in residential mortgages and 50% total as a percentage of, unfortunately, the overall assets number. I realize that you guys are just marginally below that threshold. Would that actually govern your inability to borrow, sorry, inability to lend more towards your uh, real estate portfolio going out, or rather the non-individual portfolio going out? All right, so let me try to answer your question. The first question was on collection efficiency for the current year. Mm -hmm. See, Suresh, typically what happens is that there is full stream of full force that is there in the month of March to collect installments. So even in pre-COVID uh, or pre-COVID times, you would find that uh, the collections for the month of April, which is immediately after this massive drive in March, would always be a little lower than what the normal level is. Uh, to my mind, this year what we have seen is no exception. Uh, what we are seeing now is not significantly different from what we would have seen in April 2019. Not April 2020, April 2019, which was pre-COVID. Second question on uh, on, on uh, insurance. Uh, RBI has asked us to bring down the stake to below 50% or below 50%. There is absolutely no indication or requirement from RBI or any other regulator for us to bring our stake to below 50%. That is not the case. And your third question, sorry, was what, Suresh? On that 60% and 50% NHB norm as a... Yeah. No, there we have a clear timeline on how we are going to achieve that 50% uh, or 60%. Uh, we have put down a, a periodic timeline on, on, on a, almost on a quarterly basis, and we are ahead of what we have planned. So I don't what? see that to be a problem. Our ability to lend money to non-individual loans, you said, is really not there. It's only the corporate loans or the lease rental discounting loans which don't qualify as housing. In yeah. which, uh, uh, loans given to property developers, for example, for constructing residential housing, qualifies as housing. So I don't what, see that in What could be the current number, KQ, uh, if you can share? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, what would be the current number? Number, yeah, again, the 60 and 50. I don't have the number off the top. Rangan, if you're there on the phone, can you, would you have the number readily available? Uh, I uh, we are we have worked out broadly on the this thing on the 50 percent we are higher actually we are at about 54 55 and on the 60 percent I think we are marginally lower 57 58 percent. Okay, thanks, Ranga. Yeah. Thank you. A reminder to the participants: please limit your questions to two per participant. The next question is from the line of Piran Engineer from Motilalosal Financial Services. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, congrats on the quarter. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Firstly, uh, regarding the CLSS scheme for the MIG segment, uh, uh, you know, it was till 31st March of this year and it hasn't been extended by the government yet. And if it were to not be extended, then what sort of impact uh, do we foresee on disbursement growth? 
See, very honestly, I don't see it having any material impact on the disbursement growth because a person who's buying a house is buying a house because he needs a house to stay. He's not buying a house just because uh, there is some subsidy that is uh, available uh, for, from government. Also, last year, if you recall, uh, this, if, I recall, if, if, if memory serves me right, this had come to an end in March 2020. And then somewhere in May or June, I think the government, or May probably, and I'm not very sure of the date, the government then extended by extended that by a year. So whether they extend it even now going forward, frankly, I have no idea. But whether they do or not, I don't see it making that much of a difference. See, unfortunately, I mean, COVID is a horrible thing to have happened to, 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 to people. But what COVID has done is it has made it more imperative for people to look for, you know, bigger houses, better houses, better airy houses and things like that. So we have seen that once the lockdown restrictions were removed last year, we saw a very significant uh, increase in the demand for loans, demand for housing loans. Got it, got it. So my next question is on the asset quality front. So we've seen a reduction of about five, six hundred crores in the restructured book on a quarter on quarter basis. So is this because you know the restruct or the resolution uh, it was invoked but not completed, or did these loans slip into NPL and that's why the restructuring book is down? How do we do this? Uh, it would not have happened because either the customer initially applied and then said that you know I don't need it and then the restructuring was removed or in some cases the first person may have applied and may not have been eligible so there are a variety of reasons why it could have happened but I know of cases where people applied for it and then said that look on second thoughts we don't need it. So this 4,500 odd crores is the, the restructuring that has been completed yeah. as a got yeah. it. And my last question, uh, you know, on collection efficiency, are, uh, it's about 98% and has been at 97, 98% for the last two months. Uh, this excludes all arrear payments and uh, prepayments, right? Prepayments. But does this include arrear payments also? Yeah, yeah, it includes arrear payments. But then, sir, if you know, if, uh, since the moratorium was listed, if we consistently, you know, been at 97, 98%, by now at least 2% of our individual loans should have been empty. But the ratio is still 1%. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out uh, where, you know, what the dichotomy is. So it started off as 96% and then slowly over a period of time went up from 96% to 98%, which is where we ended the month of uh, March. But as I said, going forward, looking at what the COVID situation is, uh, looking at this uh, second phase, one will again have to be uh, mindful of what happens in uh, April, May. No, no. What I meant is that the shortfall is about, it's still around 2%, right? If we are expecting 100, but we're getting 98. Uh, and in a matter of 90 days, uh, a loan should have been downgraded to NCA. So I'm just trying to wonder. Yeah, yeah, but you can't look at it like that. I'm sure you understand that customer X is not paid for the month of January, but he pays for the month of February. Customer Y pays for the month of January, but doesn't pay for the month of February. So it's not necessarily the same borrower is not paying that. So how will the same borrower always become three months? I think uh, we can take that up offline. Yeah, I'll take it offline. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of sorrow from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, so, I have two questions. One is uh, on the uh, stage three and stage two book, will it be fair to say that uh, on the non individual side, a lot of it will be driven from the corporate and the project finance book, which is excluding the LRD book? So, basically, in the LRD, I'm guessing there's no stage three uh, and minimal stage two. Yes, that would be correct. Okay. Uh, and the second is that on this restructuring, the single account restructuring that you've had, uh, what will be the LTV on that loan? Well, we carry a huge uh, security cover. Off the top, I won't be able to tell you what the LTV amount on that one, one particular loan is, but uh, the name is in public domain, so you are aware of who the customer is. Yeah. Okay. And generally, on the construction finance book, the LTV will be 50%. Uh, will that be a fair comment? Or? Generally, yes. We would have a two-time cover. Okay. Thanks. On a, on a, as a rule, huh? as, a, as a normal rule. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. It could be lower in some cases, it could be much higher in some cases. Huh? So it's a, it was more or less an average. Thank you.
The next question is from the line of Aditya Jain from Citigroup. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, just, uh, I hope I didn't miss this. Uh, did you comment on the, in the non individual portfolio, um, the side, uh, um, the, uh, the collections and the sales at the project level, um, and on the total provision that you carry? The, what is the approach behind allocating them between stage two and stage three? Uh, and uh, as let's say you uh, decide to decrease the amount of the provision of uh, how will that look? I'm sorry, I can't get your question. I can't hear your question. Uh, Mr. Jain, if you can move to a better reception area, please. Okay, let me try again. Um, so one, uh, my first point was in the non-individual portfolio, what would be the size of the stage two loan? Um, and second, if you look at the provision, the additional provisions which are being carried, um, what is the basis of allocating a certain part of it as COVID-19? Um, and is this the part which, uh, let's say in this year, gradually the macro improves, is this the part which you would look to uh, perhaps recoup uh, yes, and yes. ride back? So COVID-19 provisioning would be, for example, uh, if we have loans given, I'm giving only an example, if we have loans given, let's say to people who are working in the airline industry or people who are working in the hotel industry or people who are working in hospitality. Now, with this lock, with this possible lockdown and also the selective lockdown that we have seen today in many states, effectively some of these people may either get lesser salaries or their salaries may get cut or whatever. So in anticipation of the fortunately we do not have too many such employees or too many such customers who are employees of these, these affected sectors. But to the extent we have, we estimated what the total loan amount is and then uh, you know, carry a provisioning for that. And you're right, that is a provisioning which will get reviewed on a consistent basis from time to time. Your actual numbers, uh, Conrad will send you the, uh, would already have probably sent you the breakdown between stage one and stage two and stage three, both for individuals and non-individuals. In case you've not got it, you can take it from them. Got it, yeah, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Roshan Chutke from ICIC Prudential Asset Management. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question, sir. Uh, simple data keeping question. Uh, what is the disbursement for this quarter and what is the growth if you can share? What is the disbursement for which quarter? For the March quarter, year ended March? Yes, yeah, March. Well, the disbursement growth for the March quarter was 60%, 60. Percent, six zero. And I will be on the individual book or is it in both together? No, no, on the individual book, on the individual book. I'm talking of individuals. Non-individuals is really totally in our control. I'm talking of individuals. Individual growth was 60% in the fourth quarter. Uh, and you must remember that uh, the fourth quarter of this year was to some extent impacted by COVID because uh, COVID had never gone away. Uh, the surge in the number of cases started at least in some places like Mumbai and Maharashtra, sometime in March itself. Whereas in the previous year, the previous year, uh, January, February, and the first half of March was completely unaffected by COVID. We had the impact of COVID coming in only from, I think, around the 20th of March. If I recall right, uh, the lockdown came in from the 23rd or 24th of March. So it was really the effect was for only 10 days. Whereas this year, the effect was for pretty much the whole course. But despite that, we had a 60% growth in individual disbursements. And what is the absolute number, if you can just share that? The disbursement amount? Absolute amount of disbursements. Conrad, would you have a number? We can give it to him offline. Yeah, Roshan, I'll give it to you. Right. Thank I you don't have for the fourth quarter in particular, but for the whole year, it was about. Uh, one lakh sixty or it was about one lakh sixty or thousand crores. Yeah, uh, I question is asked, but you want to ask here. Yeah. Sorry, come again. Roughly around forty thousand crores. Forty thousand crores. Okay. I just have an official question here. Yeah. Why are we seeing a reasonable loan growth given the strong discussion with the Okay, your audio is not clearly audible, sir. Uh, can oh, you? Uh, sure. I'll come back in the speed later. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shweta Daptardar from Prabhudas Leeladar, India. Please go ahead. 
thank you sir for the opportunity so couple of questions uh, so one is uh, how are the inquiries panning out in light of second wave especially in april and may months so obviously there is some impact in terms of inquiries and in terms of uh, uh, new business but it's not so far at least it's not been as bad as it perhaps could have been but really the uh, one needs to wait for a whole month of may before one can say with complete uh, uh, confidence uh, where 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 the number stands but at the moment it's still reasonably okay uh, and obviously much much better than what it was a year ago but that the year ago was significantly impacted because of covid sure and secondly sir the fees have been sorry just to give you some numbers yeah uh, applications received have been fairly good in the month of april reasonably good okay uh, did you uh, quantify anything or did i miss quantify what the applications received i don't have the number of us of the sure Sure, not a problem. So, secondly, uh, yields have been clearly under that pressure this quarter, and you also uh, mentioned that you know disbursements have been slightly slower past three months vis-a-vis -vis previous year. So, what reasons besides this you attribute, and also uh, you know you could elaborate on uh, competition, pricing war, and in cases of balance transfers per se. Thank Let you. Let me first of all say that this thing about pricing war that you put it is complete rubbish. For a simple reason that if you were to look at our spreads, our spreads were actually widened on a year-on-year -year basis. There was sure. so much of pricing yeah. pressure, and you know, people undercutting and things like that. That obviously would not have happened. Interest rates have come down, but interest rates have come down because borrowing costs have come down. Uh, funding costs have come down in a big way. If you look at our deposits, we have been extremely proactive in terms of cutting. Uh, Uh, rates on our deposits, and also if you look at uh, other wholesale lending, uh, wholesale borrowing also, and these numbers are would be in public domain. You can see that uh, borrowing cost has been declining on a continuous basis, and that is what has enabled us to pass the benefit back to our customers. Reduction in lending rates is not, and I repeat, not a function of uh, uh, not a function of uh, uh, competitive pressure or anything like that. Uh, prepayment, prepayments you talked about. Prepayments uh, last year, last year was 10.9 percent. If you have been for last year, is I'm talking of March 2020 year end. March 2021 year end was 10.3 percent. So actually, prepayments have come down. Roughly about 60 percent of the prepayments are full prepayments, and 40 percent are part prepayments. So the trend that we see for 2020 this year is actually a little lower. Than what we had seen last year, and if you've been following HDFC for several years, as some of these analysts here have been doing, you would know that historically our prepayments are between 10 and 12 percent of the loans outstanding at the beginning of the year. This year was 10.3 percent. But as I said, 40 percent of these prepayments really are people who are just, you know, they they've got some savings or they've got some bonus and they just come and, uh, you know, sort of make a part prepayment of the loan. Uh, and then get the term reduced and keep the installment at more or less the same. So it's not that we have seen any large amount of loans getting refinanced or vice versa. Some loans, yes, but also we would have got back some, got some loans from others. Net, net, I think on that score, it's not material, but we would be a beneficiary. Definitely. Thank you, sir. That helps. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nishin Chawate from Kotak Securities Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, we have announced a partnership with uh, you know one of the housing finance companies. Uh, just trying to understand that is it a one-off thing or uh, would you see a trend where we we possibly announce partnership with uh, a couple of other HFCs as well, especially the ones who are kind of uh, you know operating in the lower end of the market. Uh, you know the unorganized sector charging 12, 14% IRRs. see we don't have anything in mind at the moment if there is some arrangements where somebody wants to uh, wants to source loans for us we are very happy to look at it if you look at the breakdown of the loan source for us uh, 27% is to hdfc bank 54% is to hdfc sales which is a 100% subsidy of us and 17% is other direct sales agents and 2% are just working customers so we have other channels other people to who who source loans for us 
which we do the credit legal technical checks and decide whether to lend money or not and that is as much as 17% one seven of our total loan. So it's something which can, we can look at more partnerships. In this particular case, uh, every single loan that is uh, uh, will come under this arrangement will ultimately get approved by HDFC. And therefore, the final control on which loan is given to what customer will be done by HDFC itself. So there is no dilution whatsoever, whatsoever, I repeat, of credit sentence. And that is the way it will be for any future arrangement that we may have. So sure. perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Roshan Chutke from ICICI Prudential Asset Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks again for taking my question, sir. Uh, firstly, uh, so if I look at the repayment this quarter, it's about... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is it better? Just marginally better. Okay. Uh, the repayments this quarter are about 23,000 crores based on the disbursement number that you have given me, 40,000, again, 40,000 crores disbursement. It is calculated to about a repayment rate of about 6.6% for the quarter without annualizing. That's a fairly large repayment rate. Why are we seeing such large repayment rates? See, if you look at you have to look at, don't, you cannot look at it like in a quarterly basis. You have to look at it for a whole year. And I'll, I'll answer your question even for the quarter, but you have to look at it for the whole year. So 10.3% of the loans outstanding at the beginning of the year was prepaid during the course of the year. Uh, and last year, and I rep I've repeated that number before, last year that number was 10.9%. In rupee terms, the total amount of prepayments we received this year was 40,000 crores. 40,000 crores represents 10.3% of the loans outstanding at the beginning of the year. Last year, the number was about 37,000 crores. So there's roughly an 8% increase in the level of prepayments against the 11 or 12% increase in the individual loan book, which is what reflects in the lower uh, prepayment uh, ratio. Now, why prepayments would have probably gone higher in the fourth quarter? A lot of these were part prepayments. Because after COVID, people would have, you know, uh, some people would have their incomes or whatever would have got affected. Then in December, many companies started doing well. Uh, many companies started giving bonuses to the employees and uh, people would have used that bonus to make a uh, uh, part of a prepayment of the loan. Uh, so it seems like we lost the connection for Mr. Shutke. The next question is from the line of Banti Chawla from IDBI Capital. Please go ahead. The opportunity. Uh, if you can sh uh, throw some outlook on the net interest margin, as we have seen the net interest margin has improved on a YY basis for the full year. And liquidity, we believe, will be still going down in FI22 with the uptick in the uh, disbursement as the economy is improving after sec uh, in second half of the FI22. So can we say net interest margin should go ahead in FI22 or if you can share your outlook on that? The net interest margin went up, if I recall right, from 3.4% last year to 3.5%. This is about a 10 basis point. Yes, sir. If you look at our numbers historically, yes. net interest margin has been in the range of 3.2% historically, and there have been times where it's been at 3.1%. I would say generally spreads have been stable to a little higher. Uh, a stable spread would, a stable or a slightly higher spread would have, would obviously improve the net interest margin. Having said that, we did a huge, we had a huge amount of negative carry on the surplus funds that we were carrying. I mentioned uh, in my earlier uh, talk that we had almost a three percentage points lower return on the excess liquidity we were carrying this year versus last year. So that would obviously have a negative impact on net interest margin. Despite that, the net interest margin for the year stood at 3.5%. So a lot also depends on the outlook going ahead in terms of how much excess liquidity we should carry. And that obviously is a function of, uh, uh, you know, how the markets play out and things like that. Personally, my view is that the way things stand today is that we don't need to really increase the level of uh, excess liquidity that we are keeping. We should therefore mean that the net interest margin should be more or less stable. But having said that, it is something which we will uh, review through our ALM committee 
on a continuous basis if we believe at any point of time that for whatever reason uh, there is uncertainty in markets and therefore we should keep a higher level of liquidity then at that point of time we will decide to do so. So otherwise I would expect net interest margin to be reasonably stable. Uh, thanks for that, sir. Secondly, as you have already said that disbursement in the non-individual portfolio is completely in your hands. So what is the thought process now? How the non-individual AEM growth should be seen in FI22? Because in FI21, that has been the laggard which has impacted the full overall AEM growth for us. See what happened uh, in San as you, you, are, you are aware of that, we discussed this many times. That on the construction finance portfolio, for some time we have been going a, a little slow. If you look at total construction loans as a percentage of our total loan book, it used to be as much as 14.14% about uh, three, or three or four years, three years ago. And now it stands at 10%. One of the reasons uh, why the non individual portfolio has not grown. Uh, sufficiently in the current year is also, I mentioned that in my, when I talked, that because of the formation of REITs, a lot of the lease rental discounting loans got paid back. So we had something like nine or thousand crores, if memory serves me right, of loans which got prepaid during the course of the year, primarily because these loans got converted into, into REITs. Now, I go to the best of my knowledge, there is no other REIT uh, which is uh, in the pipeline and therefore hopefully that kind of prepayment that we had last year should not happen. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Milanjan Karpa from Namora. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so one uh, you know question on this restructuring that you mentioned was 4,479. But on the notes to account that is 3687. What explains that difference? Ravan, you have an answer? I don't know. I think let us take it offline with you. Niranjan, sir, Niranjan, I can, you can talk to me. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the restructuring package which is implemented and invoked, but you talk to me offline, I'll return to you. I, I will do that. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to paucity of time, we take the last question from the line of Hiral Desai from Anivet Portfolio Managers. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. Mr. Desai, can you take the phone off speaker, please? Uh, we are unable to hear you. I am actually on the phone only. Is it better now? Yes, sir. Hello? Uh, is it better now? Yes, sir. You may proceed. Yeah, so my question was, you know, given that the individual or retail home loan growth has been fairly strong, Shouldn't that lead to, you know, some kind of opportunities of the developer financing side as we go along? Because a lot of inventory that is getting sold is, you know, either completed inventory which was lying on sold or inventory which was uh, near completion. So, you know, the cash flows for the developers also would have improved. Just wanted to get a thoughts on that. No, so, we do, we of course do construction finance loans. It's not that we don't do it. Uh, we do construction finance loans particularly for cases where we believe we can get a lot of retail business out of it. Sorry. Because we are looking at projects which are in the outskirts of big cities and tier two towns, tier three towns, where we would typically look at a loan of 25 lakhs, 30 lakhs, 35 lakhs, property of 50 lakhs, 60 lakhs. That, those are the kind of projects which really make, have a lot of attraction for us because from that, from there we can uh, you know, increase the level of individual business that we do. So yes, we are, we do look at it on a continuous basis. If good projects come up, good cash flows, we are happy to look at it. Sir, in that part of the business, so is the growth coming back? In which part, sorry? In the construction finance piece where you sort of work with the, the smaller developers, uh, what is happening there in terms of growth? So there are, obviously there are loans uh, to, to small developers also which are happening. For example, if you look at the uh, outstanding loans uh, in the balance sheet today, uh, there would be a lot of loans which, have, which should have got paid back also. But similarly, there have been also new loans which, should have been, which would have been given, which has maintained the amount to roughly what it was in the previous quarter. But not some prepayments, some, some repayments would have happened in the course of the quarter. 
ओके एंड द अदर इज जस्ट वन बुक कीपिंग क्वेश्चन वुड यू हैव द राइट ऑफ नंबर फॉर एफ वाई ट्वेंटी वन एंड एफ वाई ट्वेंटी कॉन्ट्रेड यू कैन गिव इट ऑफ नाइन थी आई डोंट है इट्स पार्ट ऑफ दी एक्सेल शीट विच यू सेट बट आई कैन गिव 